Uh, I am Corey Roche. I am Veronica Franklin and Michael Roche's son, uh, the middle of three, uh, from Michigan, born and raised. Uh, that's who I am. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. I like that, Michigan, born and raised. Um, so, where are you from in Michigan? Uh, I'm from Flint and Detroit. Uh, my parents worked for General Motors uh, throughout the 80s and 90s, and so we moved around a lot. Um, they took different jobs at different plants in different cities. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to actually be able to move around and see more than one city uh, in a young age, at a young age, excuse me. Right, right, yeah. Um, so you tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your background and, and what was very interesting was how your family um, Actually, how it migrated. originated all the way originated to Flint. Could you right. tell me that story? So, my father's parents, uh, my father's father, Harold, he is from the Panhandle. He's Creole, uh, mixed, mm -hmm. looks like a white man, mm -hmm. you know, a very pale, freckles all over his body, red hair. Okay. You know, so his, his mom's brother mm -hmm. had moved to Michigan to look for uh, a better life, mm -hmm. more work. Okay. And they had heard about, you know, the big three, mm -hmm. General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, yeah. and all these factories that they were uh, erecting in the north. Yeah. And so he migrated to Michigan first. Mm -hmm. And then once my uncle, I mean, my, my excuse me, once my great uncle got settled, he then went for his sister's sons, right. which is my grandfather, uh, him and my... Um, great uncle was then sent for and they got to Michigan and started working in the Buick plants, mm -hmm. which is General Motors. Um, my mother's father comes from Arkansas and she is uh, just a black woman. Uh, uh, she, her mother died and so her mother's sister, my great aunt Dari, uh, was in Flint and sent for my grandmother and her two siblings. And so she was the eldest sister of my great grandmother. And so she took on the task of raising her three children when she died. Their father had died early on in their life. I believe they were like two when he died. So the family wasn't around. So that's how my dad's side of the family got to Michigan. My mom's side of the family, excuse me, is a little bit, uh, it's a bit more eventful, you know. Uh, my mother is Puerto Rican. She's three quarters Puerto Rican. Uh, my my great grandmother was married and had a family of like three or four children, and stepped out on her husband. And so her husband told her that she could come home, but the baby could not. And so my great grandmother, uh, she had her sister, who. Uh, lived in Queens at the time and didn't have any children, raised my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother's, my, uh, my, excuse me, my grandmother's father was a Puerto Rican man, fresh off the boat. Um, so then she went back home and my grandmother was raised by her sister. So then my grandmother uh, falls in love with the Puerto Rican man uh, in Harlem and they got pregnant with my mother at 14. So then my Aunt Lillian, who raised my grandmother, my great-grandmother's sister, told her she had to go. So she put her out. <coughs> Excuse me, they have, it was nine sisters, my great-grandmother's uh, sisters, it was nine of them and four boys. And so uh, she had Aunt Essie and Aunt Dor. Aunt Essie was in Detroit and Aunt Dor was in Flint. They both had a lot of children as well. So they sent for my grandmother, put her on a bus, and that's how she got to Flint, Michigan. So um, my mother was born in New York City, uh, lived there for a couple years, and then they had to come to Michigan. So that's how my parents and my family kind of got to Michigan.
tell me a little bit about you know growing up in Michigan, and since now you can basically track your family history from mm-hmm. two different uh, states. Yeah, uh, three different states. Three different states, right? Because right. my mother's side of the family is originally from New York, and my dad's dad is originally from Florida, Louisiana, and then my grandmother is from Arkansas. Mm. So some kind of way, um, my dad's father's side of the family migrated from Louisiana to the panhandle of Florida throughout some of those years. Because my grandmother, my great-grandmother, excuse me, uh, looks white. She was German and black. So, you know, and then she got with a Creole guy. So, you know, it's it's all jumbled up. What would be your specific culture? Like, can you trace your family? You say that your family um, is Puerto Rican, so do you guys celebrate, you know, things that specifically are, are, uh, you know, things specifically to like a Hispanic background? Or Mm -hmm. is it kind of a mix between Hispanic and African-American? I think it's a mix between uh, Hispanic and African-American. We didn't speak Spanish in the home, you know, uh, but my mother did make us aware of who we were, you know, so we could know who we were. I think that's important for anybody to know who they are and where they come from some type of way, you know. So I believe she really did try to make sure that we knew every aspect of our being, like who we were, so we can exist and know and be confident. Um, we did not practice Hispanic culture, but we ate Hispanic, Hispanic food. You know, there were things that the average family wouldn't eat that we were eating, like smothered turtle, you know, um, spaghetti with lobster and shrimp, you know, uh, just different things like that. Uh, gizzards, we ate those. We would fry rib tips, you know, instead of just barbecuing them. You know, that was definitely something I think we got from, you know, her side, of my mom's side of the family. Um, that's, that's about it. Culturally, uh, we grew up black, you know, in a black neighborhood, black society. But she made sure that we were not limited by just being black. You know, like, again, like I said, I sang opera for 13 years. I was in SGA. I was on every committee, I did every play, you know, I tap danced, we did karate. I mean, she really tried to make sure, you know, whatever we wanted to do, we could do it, but we could not quit. So, music, as far as instruments, I brought the clarinet home, and she said I was stuck. I had to play it. And so I played it for probably about 11 years. And then I was like, okay, now this marching band thing is coming in. I want to play, you know, the drums in the marching band. I got to pick them up, but I still couldn't put down a clarinet. So I had to be in concert band and marching band. So, you know, just well-rounded. She tried to, I think she tried to do the best she could, you know, in the circumstances, you know. They were also drug dealers, so it was like a strict strict home with, you know, rules and guidelines and regulations, but they also were drug dealers. So they were kind of bad people. There's no kind of to it. They were bad people. They sold drugs to people, and that ruined a lot of people's lives. My youth, uh, my, my, my voice instructor, Mr. Petrick, German man, that man taught us I know for a fact I can only say me, but he he taught us about commitment, you know, um, trust, vulnerability. I mean, he even taught us how to save money. You know, we had to raise money for our uniforms and our choir robes because the school didn't have enough money to you know get us new things. So we would do fundraisers, and then the magical group, which was the elite singers, would actually go and sing at different events for money. 
And then we would put it all in this pot. And when we had enough, we divvied it all up. And that's how we got our tuxedos and our choir robes. So, you know, we talking high school. This man that is a teacher is teaching us things that half our parents are not, you know. That was definitely a monumental thing in my life that I take uh, with me every day. Um, And most of all, the death of my mother at 15, I was forced to grow up fast, quick. I mean, I I didn't have a no child I didn't have a childhood after that. I didn't have time. Hell, we hardly had somewhere to stay. No one wanted three grown boys, you know. No one, not even my grandmother, you know. So my brother, my oldest brother was 20. Well, he yeah, he was 20 at the time. I was 15, and my youngest brother was uh, 12. I went, I, my mother's sister adopted me, so then I went overseas for high school. But then we were divided. You know, a family divided is, is no good. Um, we lost, um, I don't want to say we lost contact, but because we didn't, but we lost each other, you know. Um, that bond had been broken at that point, you know. So the the death of my mother was tumultuous. It 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 rocked our world. But I chose to keep going. I realized that that was it was detriment. It was monumental. That could make or break someone. No child is supposed to see anything of that magnitude at all. And so, uh, fortunately, by the grace of God, I, you know, I don't know how other than the Lord that I made it out or even am somewhat sane. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't have it all together. I don't pretend to be. Um, and I try to let people know my story and let people know that it's a struggle every day you know even my brothers who are incarcerated you know tell them they think that i have it made and i have it easy and i'm like i went through the same thing you went through i just dealt with it differently and you have to figure out the root cause of things in order to if you don't know the past how can you affect your future how can you properly walk through your future when you haven't identified, isolated, and fixed the past. You know what I'm saying? Um, And so, with that being said, going back to growing up in a a drug dealer's house, it was horrible. Uh, You know, it's a glass house, and you throw stones, it starts to crack, and eventually it will shatter, and that's what it did. My mother died. My stepfather died by the hands of my little brother who saw him and lived with him for 10, 11 years, you know? So now that situation has left me isolated. So now I'm the only person, the sole survivor of that household. So what, what, do, what do you think? You know, that's a rhetorical question, but what do you think happened? It ruined our lives. There's nothing short of a disaster, you know. You have three boys that are doing so many things, creative, smart, you know, happy kids, and you bring drugs and a drug dealer into the home. And, you know, he lived with us for 10 years. And, you know, I think of men as leaders, guides, you know, the head, not the foot. So how can you have a man <clears throat> living with three boys for 10, 11 years and not nurture them, not show them how to save money, not teach them the essentials it takes to be a man in this society, especially a black man, you know? So it was... It was that was one huge thing for me is that 
This man lived with us for a decade and never saw my report card or asked about my grades or how I was doing or said good morning. You know what I'm saying? Just even that, you know, or took us to school or, you know what I'm saying, without a fight. It just, that was the the huge, a huge thing for me. Like we had no male guidance. You know, my father was strung out on drugs. And uh, although he was around, we saw my dad uh, every day or every other day. So I saw him, but he wasn't a, a, a father, you know. It was more like a homeboy. Like even to this day, when I call Mike, who is my biological father, it's like talking to my brother. You know, we, he's probably drunk or high, you know, on something. And he's erratic. And, you know, it's like he never left that 21, 22 year old mindset. And so, you you know, I think that's what I, I learned, I yearned for the most was a, 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 a structured home. I wanted to be something. I wanted to dream, uh, you know, and they had always told us that, you know, to shoot for the stars. And, you know, my mom always told me that I was going to be her star. I was going to do something great. You know, you also want a male to be like, this is how you have to proceed in life as a man, you know. So I think that is what uh, affected me the most out of that situation is, no no guidance, you know. It left everybody um, in a million pieces. You know, my brothers to this day still can't even get past the fact that my mother, one, is dead, and two, the life that we lived, you know. So I knew that I wanted to break the chains of the habits or and the bad things that my parents had done and my parents' parents had done because it didn't start with my parents. It started with my great-grandmother, you know. She went out on her marriage. That's already, you know, a foul play right there. That's one strike. She gave her daughter to her sister to raise her without a care. It wasn't a second thought, you know. Like those things right there can really hurt someone, and it did, because my grandmother was deeply affected by that. She didn't feel love. She wanted to know why she kept those kids, but not her, and it affected her throughout her entire life. Also, then trickled down to my mother, you know, affecting her. Their relationship was strained. <clears throat> they fought. Then... You know, another catastrophic thing happened where my grandmother's husband molested my mom. She told my grandmother, I wouldn't call her nanny, my nanny. She told my nanny and she didn't believe her. And so that was another, you know what I'm saying? So all these things <clears throat> collectively has a cause and an effect. That was the cause, excuse me. And so it had an effect. And the effect was, you know, going down into my mother's veins and then ultimately into ours. And so, again, I just wanted to break the chains. I, I, I did not want to do what my parents did. Who I am today, I attribute a lot of it to undergrad, going to an HBCU. I really do. I don't think that I would have been, I would been, would have been, excuse me, a fraction of the man that I am today had I went to a traditional, you know, university, which we call a white school. I, I would not have turned out this way. The HBCU taught me 
how to go through life as a black man, as a professional black man. I wanted to leave a legacy. I want, when I leave this earth, you know, and it's not even about my career as a costume designer and a costumer and a stylist. I just want to, for people to see the God in me, the good works, and that, you know, he was a good man and he lived by the sword. That's what I want out of life. Um, and I think I'm achieving that. It's an everyday struggle. You know, it's, 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 it's hard, you know, because you, it's red pill, red pill, blue pill. You have to choose every day, you know, especially working in entertainment. Some of the decisions can be tough because it starts to attack your morals, ethic, and character. And that's something that I stand strong on, you know. Um, I was laughing with my brother the other day, and he was he was mad because my oldest brother, he told my oldest brother that he had killed my stepfather, but he didn't tell me. And so we were on the phone, and I said, I'm glad you didn't tell me because I would have told. Brother or not, that's not right. You live with that man for 10 years. Something's wrong with you. That takes a lot for somebody to kill someone that they live with for 10 years with no regard. You know what I'm saying? Like, So for me, even if he was to get out of jail tomorrow, we wouldn't have a relationship because you live with me just as long. So would you kill me? So, you know, again, all those things attributed to me just wanting to say, I'm not that, and I will not be that. I will not be a prisoner of my ancestors' past and pain. I just won't. I refuse. I will be happy. I will live my own life. I li will make something for myself so I can say, just me. Nobody else needs to say job well done. But for me right now, if I left this earth today, you know, and I'm not perfect and I've done some crazy things as well, you know, but they only affected me. They don't affect anybody else. Whatever I choose to do affects me. And, you know, my family asked, Corey, when are you going to have kids? Why? I'm not ready. I'm still th doing things that can affect someone in a derogatory way. So I don't need to have any children right now. When, that gone, when that's gone, then that's when I'll start thinking about having a family. But right now, how can I raise a family when I'm still raising myself? So tattooing comes from, you know, the tribal times. You know, it was markings of pride and symbols of, you know, uh, wars that you've won. Or you, if you were royalty, you had certain amount of rings or what, et cetera. So it comes from that. Um, I chose tattooing because you have to have an outlet some, somewhere, you know. And this is going to sound uh, crazy and sadistic, but it's true. Tattooing, for me, is a form of cutting. That's my, my outlet of, you know, I'm going through something and I, I need to feel some pain. That's how I first got my first tattoo when my mother died, when I turned... Um, I believe I turned 17, I used my oldest brother's ID and I went and got an infinity uh, symbol with my mother's nickname through it. That was my first tattoo. And the pain helped me cope. And so now it's like a classical conditioning, you know, when I, feel something or I'm hurting or, you know, I need an exodus, uh, I will go get a tattoo. And sitting there letting somebody put these needles into you over and over again, for me, it releases something. 
it helps me get through. I get up and I go on, you know. But and I do it through life. Everything, you know, doesn't warrant me going to get a tattoo. I'm kind of a nonchalant, I don't care person anyway. You know, it doesn't affect me, I should say. Very little just really affects me or blows me out the water because I feel like I've suffered the ultimate of, you know, a mother dying or a parent dying at a young age. It's not too much more, I think, will hurt more than that. So, uh, you know, you go through things, but you just have to get up and do it all over again. But, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think the tattoos um, identify me in any way, you know. Are they meaningful? Yes. Everything that I put on my body means something. Everything that is on my body, I feel comfortable with dying with, you know. Um, but that doesn't make me who I am. You know, tattoos, this is art. It's a form of art, and then, you know, it's also a form of cutting. So it's like a, a outlet, you know. No, I have a tattoo of the Superman symbol. It means two things to me. One thing, I'm a hard, I'm a man of steel. I'm a hard man. Like, I, it's, you can't, I can't be broken. And two, I'm from the south side. And so this was my way of, I think I told you, I very rarely go home. I don't have a, a emotional attachment to it, you know. So this is my way of being like, this is where I'm from. But it's not who I am, you know. So everything, every single thing on me means something, you know. Um, but I don't think it has anything to do with, like, our culture. Because now, you know, uh, other cultures are extreme, you know. You see Caucasian men where their whole bodies are covered, you know what I'm saying. Or they have, you know... Uh, stretch their earlobes in different ways like the tribal, you know, uh, the tribes of Africa did back in the day, excuse me. They're doing, they're taking over what we used and what we went to um, culturally and taking it and putting it into their culture, you know. So I think it's, I mean, and, and I guess that's flattering, you know, because they uh, you know, we call them culture vultures, but they want everything that we have, but they don't want us, you know. Music is an interpretation of life. And if you think about it, a lot of songs, like, uh, categorize different moments and situations in your life. You can associate, like, uh, for me, prime example, Tony, 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 it feels good. That song, I have PSTD, PSTD of that song, with that song, because our house got burnt down like maybe 30 minutes after I heard that song. And it was crazy because it was on video, so it was on the TV. My mother was in the kitchen cleaning, and my little brother and I were sitting there watching videos until she got done. And the video comes on, and to this day, I swear that the devil was in that video. Real talk. So serious. The drummer was looking at me with these demonic eyes. Still playing the drums, though. But just, and, you know, I'm like eight, nine years old at the time. And I'm turning away from the TV and going back to it like, no, this guy is looking at me for real. I didn't say anything. Moments later, my mother told us to turn the TV off. We turned it off. We went upstairs. And next thing I know, we're waking up to a burning house, and we have to jump out a second-story window. So that song is correlated now for me to my house burning down. You see what I'm saying? Or partying like it's 1999. The year of 1999. I'm associate that song with that. It didn't come out in 1999, but the mere fact that the song says 1999 and 1999 is a monumental year in my life, you know. So I think, um, I think he intentionally did that, you know, for the black community. I think uh, it was time. No one had done it before, you know. 
And I think that's what we need to start doing, making real music that associates with real things in real lives, in our real culture. I think that preservation is important, um, but I think it's an important, I think it's of importance because you have to stay humble and you can never forget where you come from. Um, that's why I think preservation is important. I don't ever want anybody to say, you've changed in a bad way. And although I don't care what people think, it's just a reflection of, you know, you want, again, your light to be seen in a good way. You don't want somebody to say you're a horrible person or, you know, Corey got to Hollywood and he became, you know, a horrible person. Like, who wants that? You know what I'm saying? I want even my family to be proud to say, like, that boy just went out there, did his thing, followed his dreams, and stayed on the same path that he was on before he got out there. Still a God-fearing man, you know, still trying to live right, you know. That's what I want. I mean, and it's nobody's standard but mine. I'm my biggest critic, and I'm my hardest critic, you know. Every day, I I try to keep myself or, or keep myself at a, a level and keep myself, I try to keep myself accountable, basically, every day. Hold myself accountable to a level of, I don't want to say godly level, but, you know, of to me, God is what's right, and so I try to live right, you know, and so I, I challenge myself every day. Again, we all fall short, you know. I'm nowhere near perfect, but I try to do things right. How do I see what we've discussed immortalized into a portrait? Um, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, but as long as it encompasses me following following my dreams and being free and happy and breaking it some people call them curses chains you know uh, situations just showing, reflecting that I am continuing and will always continue to break out of anything that is not right and not of God that my family did. I will never, ever um, repeat. I don't want to repeat. I want to make new, make new chains, make new uh, you know, history. Again, I want to be a legacy, you know. And it, and it doesn't have to be to the world, which I actually already have. My name is on several projects that will forever go down in history. You can look at the TV shows that I've done 30 years from now, and my name is still going to be there saying that I worked on that production, you know. So... I created a name for myself, and that's what I want to continue to do. So, so that's what I would like reflected in the portrait, just me breaking the chains and being happy and free and following dreams.